it's high noon, so um, let's see if we can get started here. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Science Circle in Second Life. Uh, as you know, the Science Circle is a uh, grant funded uh, nonprofit uh, dedicated to uh, the development of uh, virtual world platforms for education. Um, so I uh, want to remind everyone to be on your best behavior, please. Um, uh, and also, while I'm thinking of it, um, I wanted to remember uh, next month is the science fair. Um, so um, we want we have we have a, a, a request for submissions, I guess you call it, or um, uh, for scientists to um, uh, to have a booth at the science fair. So uh, please contact uh, Shiloh um, if uh, you have any questions or are interested in participating in the science fair. Um, and uh, sort of with that housekeeping out of the way, um, our topic today is the uh, medicinal or therapeutic use of psychedelic drugs. Um, this is a topic I've been interested in for quite a while. When we began to hear reports in recent years um, of uh, some surprising uh, uh, clinical uh, studies that uh, seem to report that drugs like psilocybin and mescaline, for example, I think MDMA too, um, even even LSD um, can. Uh, be uh, therapeutically helpful for treating um, certain um, emotional or uh, um, uh, uh, mental ailments like um, um, like uh, like serious depression, uh, PTSD. Um, I think even um, some elements of bipolar disorder, things like that. Um, uh, and one of the, one of the reasons that this has uh, that they have attracted attention is that they seem to have very comparable to results to traditional or well-known um, uh, uh, mood drugs or psychiatric drugs uh, without the side effects that are often attendant with these drugs. Um, I don't know any of you who may, may be taking uh, mood drugs for depression um, or if anyone has been on antipsychotics, they have I mean, antipsychotics especially have really horrible side effects. Um, so, um, so if this bears out, it it, it seems like it could be a very um, uh, uh, well. It seems like a worthwhile path to pursue uh, if they have the therapeutic benefits um, and the and reduced side effects. So it'll be interesting to see where these go. So to uh, to talk about this with us today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Robert Hendricks uh, tagline, uh, who's going to uh, give us a little bit of the um, sort of uh, medical and biological background uh, on these substances. And then um, also Stephen Gazier, uh, Stephen Zootfly, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about the uh, sort of the history of, uh, of of the use of psychedelics um, uh, in uh, medical therapies. So, um, and I am just going to give you a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about, uh, kind of specifically the kind of drugs that have been studied. If you'll see behind me on the slide machine, slide viewer there is um, a photograph of mushrooms. These are the psilocybin mushrooms, uh, what are called magic mushrooms, um, which are the source of psilocybin. And let me see. Turns out that psilocybin, if you look to the right here um, in sort of the box insert, the psilocybin is kind of the teal shaped molecule. Um, you'll see it has a um, kind of a, a uh, kind of a ring structure at one end. Um, and then uh, well, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more detail there. And you can see over on the left that the psilocybin molecule binds to the 5-HT2A receptor. 
This is the serotonin receptor in the brain. So that's interesting. So it binds to the serotonin receptor. And this is a PET scan image uh, under the effects of psilocybin. Um, and I think if you kind of go counterclockwise from the bottom right and go around, you can see uh, the increased activation in the brain. In the, in the bottom left quadrant, uh, you can see that the brain is really lit up. Um, and um, um, one, uh, one hypothesis for um, how these drugs induce hallucinations is that they do bind to, you know, uh, uh, existing receptors in the brain, um, but, uh, but, they, but the drugs, of course, are not the intended agonist for those receptors, uh, and so they tend to generate sort of chaotic signaling in the brain, um, and it's thought that this chaotic signaling is what produces the hallucinations. And mescaline uh, is another psychedelic that comes from the peyote cactus. And here's a picture of what a peyote cactus looks like. Uh, and this is a picture of mescaline. It has, um, again, it has a ring structure. Or I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah. So, um, and um, the, uh, uh, and then a bunch of um, methylated groups here in an amine group. Yeah, peyote buttons. Yeah, uh, Shiloh asks, "What are the peyote buttons?" The peyote buttons are those little, little mushrooms that look like, <laughs> kind of like throw pillows. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is an image of um, mescaline, uh, and you can see here it has this uh, double, kind of ring system here at the bottom. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, psilocybin, rather. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I think I got those flipped. So the psilocybin has the this double ring structure, and the mescaline has the, the single ring. Uh, but what's interesting here, well, the reason I, I wanted to show this slide is you can see the structural similarity between uh, uh, psilocin and serotonin. Psilocin is the metabolite of psilocybin. So uh, psilocybin is the natural form um, when you ingest it, it gets processed by the body. Uh, some uh, groups are cleaved off into the psilocin, which is the psychoactive uh, form of psilocybin. And you can see how similar it is to the serotonin. So it's an end psilocy and psilocin also binds to the serotonin receptor. Um, so both of these hallucinogens bind to the serotonin receptor in the brain. A little bit surprising to me that Serotonin, which is such uh, an important uh, molecule regulating mood and perception in the brain, is kind of nonspecific that way. Um, and uh, that may be fairly common because the, um, uh, the, the, the brain sort of has endogenous forms of, um, of, uh, of psychedelic drugs. Uh, you know, there are cannabinoid receptors for, for naturally produced endogenous cannabinoids in the body, um, which uh, the THC molecule of marijuana, also a cannabinoid, binds to those endogenous receptors. So, um, so that may be one reason why these uh, receptors are, are sort of nonspecific that way, because there may be sort of endogenous versions that the, the body needs to be able to recognize as well.
And let me see if I have, I don't know if I have one more. That might be my last slide. Yeah, so that's my last slide. So I just wanted to give you a brief, uh, just a quick introduction uh, to the sources and structure of the uh, of the types of um, uh, therapeutic uh, psychedelics that we're going to be talking about. Um, and, uh, and Phil mentions, it's interesting, not many molecules have a phosphate group. Exactly, it is interesting. Um, um, uh, okay, so, um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, tagline, uh, Dr. Hendricks, if you're uh, ready to proceed uh, with that brief introduction, um, I'm going to remove my slide machine here, and um, I'll uh, hand the microphone over to you. Can you hear me? Uh, just barely, a little bit quiet, but... Um, can't hear you. Yes. How about now? Okay. One of the things you can hear me. All right. Okay. Loud and clear. Good. I'm coming down crashing here. See that? That's what happens when you have your screen up high. Okay. First off, I like this picture. I took it last fall and it shows Jupiter and Saturn approaching conjunction. The important thing here for my thinking in the history of this is the term uh, which I coined actually in my own head, uh, neurophysiologic malware. Um, and that is to bring up the point of how various drugs have been presented to the public. Uh, before I proceed, I want to just ask people to think for a moment back it should be a memorable thing if it was very um, intense, but what is the longest anyone here has gone? Not, not really. What's the longest any of you have gone without eating, without food, without sustenance, maybe just water? And I won't talk about myself, but uh, uh, if you haven't, okay, I see somebody went for days. You go for days, you understand a lot. You understand a lot about what it is being human. Um, let's see. I've, um, primitive mankind was out there, like all the animals checking out all the plants, looking for anything to eat. And I think they were probably much more in touch with ingesting something and then having a bad effect from it than uh, modern people in developed societies where they're eating all this processed crap, um, processed food, uh, you don't know what you're eating. Um, but um, uh, some people are more uh, uh, sensitive or, or uh, perceptive than others and will figure out I had an effect from eating something. And I wanted to touch uh, for a moment on what an alkaloid is. Uh, we hear about alkaloids all the time, or depending on where you uh, listen to things. Uh, alkaloid is a common term. Um, I find most people, uh, medical students, often don't have a real good idea of what an alkaloid is. It's a class of molecules. It's a big, varied class. It's, uh, you think of um, like an alkyl carboxyl, with a carboxyl group on the end, a, a fatty acid. Uh, that's a pretty defined kind of molecule. Uh, the thing about alkaloids are generally um, well, they're naturally occurring. About 12,000 have been isolated. There's many more uh, uh, yet to be discovered as long as we don't burn down all the uh, forests um, too quickly. Uh, but uh, they generally have a nitrogen and an amide. Uh, that's, that's like an ammonia group. Um, true, they're, they're divided into three kinds of uh, uh, 
subclasses of true alkaloids, protoalkaloids, and pseudoalkaloids. In true alkaloids, the plants derive the molecule from an amino acid such that the ammonia group is in a ring. They have these heterocyclic rings, as you see with morphine here. Morphine was isolated in uh, 1804 by a German guy about 21 years old who was an apprentice, hardly knew what he was doing, had really crummy equipment, but he was very curious and intelligent. And he found from opiates that had been used, morphine was 10 times more potent, and he studied it for a long time. Uh, for his, his life. He died in the 1840s. So 1804, morphine emerged. When I was in medical school, they used to say if you were isolated on a desert island and you had one drug to choose to have with you, what would you take? And the answer was, without question, morphine. And I won't go into that, but um, other samples of alkaloid drugs uh, that are shown here. They're drugs because they were derived from plants but um, and marketed by companies, but atropine, which um, blocks um, acetylcholine uh, receptors. And when you get a depolarizing um, kind of paralysis, like from organophosphates, like in irresponsible people, uh, use uh, organophosphate insecticides indiscriminately without training, and they get themselves sick. Uh, atropine's one of the first things that's used. Atropine used to be uh, very commonly used in uh, uh, by anesthesiologists. Uh, quinine is uh, used as a preventative for malaria. And uh, so anyway, those are just three examples of these many different secondary metabolites of plants that, uh, mostly plants that uh, have nitrogen bases. The uh, proto-alkaloids um, have the ammonia group from the uh, amino acid outside of the heterocyclic ring, and the pseudo-alkaloids, such as caffeine, um, are not derived from an amino acid. Um, hang on one second. I am sorry. I have to turn down the ambient. Uh, uh, I have a bird screaming in my ear or something here. Okay. Maybe that'll quell it. So anyway, I think it's important to understand what alkaloids are. And um, they're varied. And um, why do they exist? Well, they, there's a, a evolutionary benefit for plants. Uh, you imagine a jungle in the primeval forest uh, with all the insects and other creatures. Uh, trees would be eaten alive if they didn't taste badly. Um, uh, plants produce alkaloids uh, because they're generally bitter tasting. And uh, if you ever taste one, you, you're like, well, Coffee's bitter. Uh, uh, cocoa is bitter, raw cocoa. Uh, and um, uh, they're also fairly insoluble in water, but they are somewhat soluble in alcohol. Uh, hence, uh, the 19th century was full of elixirs, which were alcohol uh, as a solvent for various alkaloids. Um, but the um, plants defend themselves using these bitter tasting chemicals and uh, poison dart frogs, by the way, um, uh, are not so good to eat as, as well for obvious reasons. They have the same deal. There are alkaloids that are uh, produced by animals. Um, there's a few examples of that. They're also produced by bacteria and fungus. Okay, um, I want to zero in as quickly as I can on tryptophan-derived uh, uh, ergot alkaloids. I have this 
uh, slide just to show the range of amino acids. And ornithine is, is a non-protogenic amino acid. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, ergot's derived from tryptophan. Uh, if you look at this lower left-hand corner uh, 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 molecule, you'll see uh, the same double ring structure. It's an indole that was in mesc, mescaline, uh, that Baragon was talking about. Uh, it has a pyrrole, a pyrrole ring uh, with an, a, a nitrogen, and you count around counterclockwise, and uh, two things happen to this. Uh, there's a rate-limiting step in which an oxidase puts a hydroxyl group on the five position, um, and if you count from the nitrogen on that um, uh, those lower two rings on the tryptophan, count around counterclockwise, one, two, and skip the crack, three, four, five, uh, you'll come to, and you count the N as well, uh, you'll come to f the five point where you end up with a hydroxy group. So that's the rate limiting step in making serotonin. Then the carboxyl group is removed and a hydrogen replaces it. So you end up with tryptamine, 5-hydroxy tryptamine, which is serotonin. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about serotonin because uh, even medical students I've talked to don't really seem to understand what serotonin does uh, in many cases. Uh, so anyway, you think back over the history of man, there's always been a, a sense of wanting to expand the consciousness, to seek esoteric knowledge or some kind of vision or insight about the world. Um, and these plants can provide that in a sense. They provide the at least the illusion of it. Um, sometimes it's bad. Uh, you have uh, one of the things serotonin does, it can be a vasodilator or vasoconstrictor depending on the vascular bed. And ergot, and you notice that the base of the ergot molecule is that endol. Um, uh, let's see, hold on a second. Um, uh, is the endol molecule, uh, endol um, moiety um, that has that uh, nitrogen five, uh, five uh, atom ring attached to a benzyl group, and then you build on it. And so uh, uh, in ergodine, which comes from a fungus that grows on rye, you get these little black clumps of fungus, and it gets ground into the, the uh, um, flower, and uh, you can get people with acute and chronic ergotism. Uh, uh, think of the Salem witch trials. All these things occur in and are interpreted and managed within the culture and understanding of the times. And often religion is uh, maybe a hindrance. Uh, there's uh, um, the Salem witch trials, they figured, well, they, they had the, this narrow group of people from a small, uh, little diversity, and um, they got group think, and they got stoned with chronic ergotism uh, uh, from eating uh, moldy rye bread without knowing what they were poisoning themselves with, and they started to lose it. And so they could be convinced that somebody must be a witch. There is good argument to made uh, that the uh, Salem witch trials arose, like a lot of places, from chronic ergotism or ergot poisoning. Um, ergot can have hallucinatory effects, but it also causes such vasoconstriction, it can cause gangrene of the fingers and the toes and the tip of the uh, uh, the earlobe. 
you know, when you're operating on the earlobe, you can't inject it with a vasoconstrictor because it's basically got an vascular supply. And somebody that doesn't know that injects with a vasoconstrictor and the earlobe can necrose and slough, uh, which is not, uh, that's iatrogenic uh, harm, harm caused by the treatment, which has been common in medicine, especially before 1916. At any rate, serotonin has effects on all kinds of cell types, uh, and especially neurons we're going to focus on. Platelets are a big component. Platelets help clump and uh, cause clotting. Uh, leukocytes, inflammatory action, uh, action. Uh, enterochromophyphin uh, cells, uh, uh, those are lining the gut. They are derived from um, the uh, neuro, um, neural crest cells in the embryo, and they are like short-range uh, hormone-secreting uh, cells. But the 90% of the serotonin is in the gut. Okay, to talk about the... Uh, uh, serotonin in the brain, uh, there's this area in the midbrain um, where you have these Rafe, uh, these um, um, especially the medial Rafe, um, uh nuclei. Uh, the lower ones shoot down the spinal uh, cord. Hmm. Uh, somebody clicked me. I got it. Rats. Uh, and the upper ones, I gotta, please don't click on the projector. I have to figure out how to protect it from being activated. But serotonin is produced almost exclusively in these cell bodies, these nuclei in the brain stem or in the midbrain. And um, they have projections to almost the entire brain, including cerebellum cerebrum, basal ganglia, um, every major neural pathway has adjacent serotonin neurons um, uh, almost intimately associated with it. And uh, this is one reason why uh, the uh, understanding of what these drugs do is uh, growing into studies of complexity and um, uh, self-organized uh, criticality. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, that has to do with uh, scale-free distributions, and uh, it's a way of analyzing networks, and that's being applied to all kinds of things. But I wanted you to hear that and know about it, and maybe check it out if you're interested. Um, Self-organized criticality. That's been a, a, a big thing in st statistics and statistical analysis uh, that's emerged in the last 20 years. But uh, in terms of, I don't know if you can read this well, but uh, um, uh, I, I have uh, beh behavior effects, um, the CNS effects, and um, um, the uh, drugs that are used in serotonin. Uh, serotonin has uh, pervasive uh, effects on organs and uh, uh, in physiology. It's, it's not a simple thing to uh, figure out. Um, it often modulates, it often has uh, excitatory or uh, inhibitory fibers, and uh, um, there are 15 receptors known, uh, seven families, and most of them, uh, uh, all, of, all of them have at least an A and a B subgroup. Uh, and uh, uh, also of interest is uh, these serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, SSRI, uh, antidepressants are a big thing, uh, and can cause problems with your serotonin system. Uh, one way to understand serotonin a little better may be to look at what happens if you have low serotonin levels 
and it tends to be associated with mood disorders and particularly major depressive disorder. Um, the, uh, there's some evidence that might have something to do with autism. Uh, there's not a good support for uh, hyperactivity, attention deficit type problems, um, or schizophrenia. Uh, although you often will read that uh, serotonin and schizophrenia are uh, related. They may be, but it's not clear how. Um, Tagline, this is uh, Baragon. Do you mind if I uh, interrupt to ask a question here real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so um, uh, so uh, depressive orders may be caused by, uh, by low serotonin levels. So uh, is it thought that uh, psychedelics, uh, well, psychedelics basically, um, they bind to the serotonin receptor. So, uh, is, so could one of the therapeutic effects be to elevate the sort of effective amount of serotonin um, in the brain you're, to counteract it? You are anticipating where we're going. Okay, <laughs> because my other thought, my other thought was uh, whether these psychedelic drugs uh, sort of outcompete uh, natural serotonin um, in some way. Yes, they so do. That would, that would be another thing. Okay. Yes, All right, very they good. do. And All right, very good. this is uh, so. I wanted to let you know, just generally, is this the bigger aspect? There's so much depression in society uh, that uh, serotonin is associated with that. What happens if you have too much serotonin? Like if somebody changes their selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, in other words, reuptake of the serotonin from the synapse so that it increases the activity against the receptors, stimulating uh, the uh, serotonergic system. Um, what if uh, they change medications and end up with too much serotonin or maybe they're taking a supplement that's weird and uh, that can be life-threatening and agitation, restlessness, headache, confusion, the heart beating and high blood pressure. Uh, the, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, some of that harkens back to serotonin effects of ergot, dilated pupils, loss of muscle coordination, twitching muscles, uh, muscle rigidity, heavy sweating, shivering, goosebumps, and because of the serotoninergic effects on the gut, diarrhea, and uh, uh, abdominal pain and all those sorts of things. Uh, people on acid trips often are not bothered by it, uh, but they will generally sweat and they have no appetite. They're satisfied. They have no interest in food uh, while they're tripping. So I thought this would be important to tell you about. It's serotonin is described as the feel-good neurotransmitter. And it's in very simplistic terms, maybe that's true. It says it's, if you don't have enough, you get depressed. Um, four ways you can jack up your own serotonin without having to pay anybody uh, for drugs or therapy. Uh, one is try to adjust your attitude on a consistent basis, looking at yourself in the mirror and telling yourself aloud that you're a good person and that you're doing fine and everything's going to be good. And because it's not just your brain dictating, your brain responds to everything coming in from the body and it can include your own voice. Uh, so, Positive mood induction is what that's called. Bright light is important. Uh, people up in Finland know about that. Um, exercise, particularly aerobic. Uh, if you do that on a regular basis, that's one of the best ways to uh, jack up uh, good serotonin levels, as well as dopaminergic circuits, which are the reward circuits like I talked about with, when I talked about meth. And then finally, diet. Uh, we talk about uh, there's there are 21 amino acids uh, that are in the human uh, uh, proteins. Um, 
and um, uh, one is not uh, coded uh, directly for uh, by uh, uh, transfer RNA, but uh, uh, it's um, and that that has a selenium uh, combined with cysteine, but uh, tryptophan is. It's you can't produce it in your own body. You got to ingest it from some other source. Generally, plants, cheese. Uh, I I tend to find uh, animal products disgusting. So I uh, I don't I can't think of any that I would recommend there. Okay, and psychedelics. I wanted to put this in just to emphasize that these are Schedule One substances. Uh, and how they became Schedule One substances is kind of interesting. Uh, there is uh, evidence that cluster headaches, substance abuse disorders, addiction, uh, especially alcohol addiction, end-of-life anxiety, potential depression, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is associated with low serotonin, uh, may be helped by uh, use of LSD. Uh, there are people taking low dose LSD every morning, which is probably not a good idea to take something like that on a daily basis. Lastly, Albert Hoffman is a fellow from Basel, Switzerland, uh, who was uh, really a genius. But in 1938, he isolated uh, or, or uh, derived uh, LSD uh, from uh, ergot. Uh, uh, and um, five years later, he revived it and um, ingested it. And the I didn't know that LSD was derived from ergot. I thought LSD was basically uh, just completely chemically synthesized, uh, sort of out of thin air. I didn't realize it was derived from a natural substance. Now, most of these uh, pharmaceuticals that are... Um, you look at the complexity of alkaloids, it would be really hard to um, um, uh, uh, synthesize. Uh, someone's asking if you, you could have a hallucinogenic experience without taking LSD later, and these are called flashbacks. Uh, and that's, that's true, but that's not the common. Uh, Oliver Sacks uh, uh, took uh, when he was about 30 years old, took, uh, I think, LSD, some cocaine, and some methamphetamine, or, uh, and uh, stared at a wall and imagined he wanted to see uh, indigo on the wall, and suddenly a huge blob of indigo appeared, and it was beautiful to him, and it disappeared, and he thought that was sad, but uh, he realized my mind can create that. Um, yeah, Sachs wrote a whole book about... Um... Uh, basically making the argument for therapeutic use of uh, of, uh, of psychedelics and hallucinogens. Yeah, Albert Hoffman uh, ended up taking um, LSD about 15 times over his lifetime, as he described it. And um, um, in 1958, he also was um, a leader in the group that uh, derived uh, psilocybin, uh, isolated psilocybin. Uh, so he, he was quite an achiever. Uh, now, I just wanted to show here, you look at the relationship of uh, tryptophan with its indole ring there. That's, it's, it's a flat resonating ring and um, geometrically flat and attached to uh, this uh, um, um, uh, uh, three carbon uh, uh, chain that has the uh, amino uh, group on it. Um, uh, uh, it's an amino acid. Uh, anyway, ergot has that uh, base indole ring in it. And then you look at uh, uh, LSD and you see the modification that, uh, or modifications uh, that lead to its structure. Now, because it, it, it uh, tends to, I think, one 
uh, the, um, it, 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 it adheres to uh, re, uh, serotonin receptor types one, five, I'm sorry, one, two, five, and seven. Um, one, five, and seven have, have been difficult to study. Uh, the 2A receptor seems to be the biggest uh, actor. In the 2A receptor, it gets caught in there inside the receptor and there is a chemical lid as it's described that was picked up by a crystallography by a researcher at university of north carolina that protects the lsd so it stays in this receptor because one of the interesting things i always wondered about was how is this thing so potent yeah how it, does it last so long i mean the lsd trips last for hours yeah, it's, uh, it's thought that the molecule is caught in the receptor for about 40 minutes. And, that is, that's wild. And uh, yes, so, uh, oh, just one last thing. It, yeah. it, it, um, um, it's, it takes so little. The active dose, what's called a moderate dose of LSD is like 50 to 200 milli, uh, 50 to 150 milligrams. Um, I think that Hoffman on his first... Uh, trip took 200 or more. I, I'm sorry, micrograms. Micrograms. We're talking micrograms. Um, 50 to 200 micrograms would be. Uh, 200 might be the high end of a. Uh, yes, I, I misspoke. Uh, Shalom. Uh, 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 a good dose. He took a whopping dose, and he got fr afraid. He was afraid he was losing his mind. And uh, I bet um, it um, the um, uh, the sensitivity is because it has such focal adherence, uh, particularly to these um, serotonin uh, type two A receptors that seem to be the activator. But as you recall from the diagram of all these projections throughout the brain of serotonin uh, tracks, what does that mean? How does it, how does uh, it get these effects? Oh, it's oh, really oh. hard to describe. Uh, Robert, I'm really sorry. I, I'm afraid I really do have to cut you off because we only have about okay. 15 minutes left. And okay, I still, we still done. need to get Stephen in. Uh, I do want to let everyone know, of course, that, um, uh, that uh, uh, Taglines that slides uh, are uh, available on the on the Google Drive. Um, really, really sorry, and and uh, we um, um, hopefully you know we we're planning to have a fireside chat uh, later this week. I think Wednesday evening. So we have uh, we'll have another opportunity to uh, dig into this some more. Uh, so one last sentence. Sorry, but, all right, one, one last sentence. sentence. 1957. Uh, a an essay was written by a guy named Wasson who went down to Oaxaca, Mexico and partook of mushrooms that were used. It was in uh, tribal use. They didn't even speak Spanish. And um, then uh, uh, he wrote an essay there and it became a high point of interest. Um, eventually, uh, meanwhile, the U.S. government, the CIA, started using LSD to uh, uh, give to lawmen and um, uh, suspects, uh, subjects rather, who were uh, unaware that they were being uh, uh, stoned with it. And that they, these were generally paranoid rednecks who carried guns and things. And so they had bad trips. And so I think a lot of the junk that was fed to the gray-haired congressmen and uh, senators who knew nothing about this, um, was about how this was a psychotoxic drug rather than psychotropic drug. And yeah, there's a there's a very troubling history to how some of these drugs came to be Schedule One drugs. There's a a troubling history of racism, for example, that um, you know that they uh, marijuana in particular, but I think also uh, 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 peyote. Um, were were tagged as used by you know Mexicans and so forth, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and racist congressmen you know sort of used them to um, to disparage uh, ethnic groups, um, Native Americans also and so forth. 
Um, right. And one reason they were scheduled to schedule one so that they was so that they could, you know, put all these uh, these ethnic groups in jail. So it's very troubling. Yes, it was used as a uh, weapon uh, to uh, uh, suppress people. So yeah. my slide thing is going high again. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Thank thanks you. very much, Robert. I appreciate that. Um, but uh, but I do want to give uh, Stephen a chance to uh, for his presentation also. So Stephen, the mic is yours. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for all that background. So, you know, I am not a professional when it comes to think about psychology, psychiatry, or these types of molecules. Again, I have a background in biochemistry. And I used to teach human anatomy. And when it came across my desk a few years ago, listening to Michael Pollan on the interview circuit, talk about his book, How to Change Your Mind, what the science of psychedelics teaches us about consciousness, dying, addiction, depression, and transcendence. I was like, this is amazing. Because uh, one of the things that, that I advise younger people these days, and when I think about profession and biology, is that you really want to be at a place where there are new technologies, new theories, and funding and an application. And so this new ways of studying neurobiology uh, with positronic emission topography, uh, much better double blind research studies, this is a great place to be. And I think the impact of this will be rather amazing. And I think Michael Pollan in his book does a really good job of conveying that. And so I really recommend the book. And this is what I kind of crash read over the past week. So let me give a couple quick summaries from his points. And that, yeah, he kind of talks about the LSD invention with Albert Hoffman. And what's kind of amazing about this, this was a strategy that was common among uh, pharmaceutical companies, was to kind of search the library of plant chemicals and then try and synthesize them to have them be pure and then useful in studies. And so LSD was something I think meant for like an analgesic. Uh, and it didn't work that way. When they studied it in animals, and as uh, Tagline mentioned, it was five years later, he brings it out of the lab. He's thinking, oh, this is an interesting molecule. And he accidentally doses himself. So <laughs> this is another one of these great stories of an accidental uh, discovery. Uh, but it was very obvious that it was something that had very powerful effects. Uh, and then also just, if you ever see this come across your calendar, April 19th is called Bicycle Day to celebrate this. Um, Michael Pollan went to a, an anniversary of Bicycle Day where Hoffman was actually there. I think this was back in 2006 and he describes it. Now, around the same time, well, a little, a little bit later, uh, Tagline mentions the Seeking the Magic Mushroom, which was a photo spread, an essay in life. And again, amateur mycologist Robert Gordon Watson managed to, over several trips, get the confidence of a shaman down in Mexico, because this was very secretive. There was actually very few people in Western society outside of Mexico knew about um, psilocybin and mush magic mushrooms. But again, this hit the scene. And I think if you go back and look historically, and this is what um, Pollen talks about, is that people were really excited about this. And these very immediately were seen as helpful. People got were happy after using them. And so the applications of them to treating addiction, again, it wasn't called PT, PTSD at the time, uh, and depression and anxiety were all immediately realized. And so there was a flowering of research that's actually occurring. And the company that Hoffman worked for actually made it free for people. Uh, again, I don't want to talk about other people. And I'm not good at keeping track of names, so I can't really go too much about what the book said. But as an example here, I just mentioned the Spring Grove experiment uh, in Maryland. But again, this was an NIH funded research. Another person that you may have heard about is Timothy Leary. 
So here's someone who's very famous because he's very outspoken about uh, mind altering drugs. In particular, the idea that they kind of undermine the way we think about the mind works and maybe about how society. And I think that is one of the major contributing factors to the, uh, what you might call the reversal of society to these being useful drugs. And of course, you know, as they reach a lot of the counterculture outside of the medical clinic, that's where people got very worried about it. But again, up through the late six, mid late sixties, uh, there was a lot of government funding for this. There were a lot of people seeing positive effects. Uh, there was a lot of publications. But because of the outspokenness, partly of Timothy Leary, and then people really looking at bad behavior by these medical researchers, right? So one thing that Timothy Leary did and Richard Albert did at um, at Harvard, like all these practices of getting consent, of having patients knowing what they're doing was not very well followed. And then the other thing is very few of these studies were done in a kind of golden classic way of doing it with double blind studies. And so the actual value of that research, as people look back on it, you know, from a statistical standpoint of view, they may or may not have really been accomplishing their goals of convincing people these are really useful for therapy. Uh, and so that's really, I mean, the context that I grew up in is that LSD is a horrible thing. You don't want to take it. It's obviously a legal molecule. You can go to federal jail for it. And those, that, that was kind of the sense of it. And certainly very little research. Uh, with one exception, at least in um, the Western Hemisphere, up in Saskatchewan, they were still working on it for alcohol addiction. And they were seeing really good results with that. But otherwise, pretty much cleared out. Now, what Pollen does go on to say is that there was a big underground for this. And so in San Francisco in particular, they, there were a lot of shamans who still did LSD psilocybin uh, treatments with individual people. And that ultimately is something where uh, Pollen goes through a own personal experience. He's a six-year-old man. He felt maybe he could learn from this and writing about it. And he did basically three trips, one with LSD, one with psilocybin, and another one called The Toad. Uh, and that's what he kind of details a lot in his book after he goes through the history of all of us. And then the final part of the book really focuses on this modern revival of actual good research when it comes to understanding how these molecules can be used for therapy. And kind of the landmark paper is from the Roland Griffiths lab out of Johns Hopkins, where they kind of took an interesting different tact. Where normally you'd, in this type of medical physiology research, you would try to kind of have a lot of physiological markers and outcomes and whatnot. In this case, they really just focused more on the experiential uh, patient things that happened. And try and publish that, and then to make the case that look, you know, particularly people who are dealing with say end of life decisions, depression about life threatening uh, diseases or pathologies, this has value. Now, they weren't trying to make the case that it has long out term effects right away, but that's ultimately what's happened. Where Roland Griffiths has fought up several publications showing that there's about an eighty percent effectiveness in treating depression and anxiety for people with, with diseases. Um, people are seeing good results with uh, addiction, especially alcohol addiction. The guy who actually funded, found, sorry, founded, founded Alcoholics Anonymous used LSD to help him get past his, his addictions. Uh, and so the, uh, the kind of current state of things and this is what I think is amazing and how to advise young people. And uh, Pollen goes through some of this too. There's some other researchers that are now doing a lot of brain scanning technology, really trying to understand the chemistry as uh, Baragon showed that we actually are understanding these molecules, how they're interacting it from the clinical standpoint. And so then kind of the thing that I think Pollen makes a very good case, although it's a little bit less scientific as a way to you know, talk about this, is that what is the meaning of the mind, right? So when people have descriptions and scientists kind of dance around this issue, people have mystical experiences. 
and they're com commonly seen God, or sometimes they actually are seeing their own birth, or they're seeing the universe and amazing things, and they interpret it as God or some other sort of mystical being guiding them and giving them advice and seeing dead people. And people take it that way. That's how they will actually interpret it. But is it that way? But what does it mean to have a mind? And the final thing I'll say is that Pollen's kind of main description about how he thinks this works, and he's again, he's getting this from conversations with scientists, is that these drugs cause an ego dissolution. That when you think about anxiety, you are a person who you can conceive of that as something where you're getting so self-centered about what may happen. You're getting freaked out about the future and how it affects you. And so if you have this chemical compound that does something to your neurophysiology, affects certain parts of brain centers that dissolve this sense of self as being very and extremely self-centered, then you can actually deal with addictions or anxieties because you don't have the sense of you. And what's really important, of course, and this is where the 1960s, 70s got it wrong, is that when you think about these as a therapy, you don't want to just think of this as a pill. It's extremely important to have a context, a setting, and a guide, and kind of some mantras or a plan of how to deal with the things you're going to see. So one of the things that got Timothy Leary in trouble was that people were being described as undergoing psychoses after taking these drugs during their, you know, their, their studies. It probably actually wasn't psychoses as, as we would clinically pathologically describe it. People were probably just very super anxious and freaked out from what they couldn't understand and had no context or understanding of how to deal with it. So I think that that's an important context of it as well, that when we think about how we say this, that guidance is very important. But that's actually one of the things that undermines the research as well, is that you don't know what the influence of that context and your guides might be. Uh, that's one thing that, you know, Pollen makes very clear is that some of his guidance very much influenced the way and the things that he saw in terms of treatment. But what seems to be relatively clear is that statistically, as people study this, uh, people have good outcomes. And now that we have a more statistically rigorous experimental design way of doing it, and we can also now correlate this with physiology things that we can study, with brain scans, et cetera, follow-up studies, this is a great time to be trying to understand this. And there's a lot of promise for this to happen. On the other hand, again, one of the main things it's doing is taking people's egos away from theirs from themselves. And you can imagine that when you think about that being a very widespread thing, you know, you can imagine there are companies or governments who would also try and suppress that to some degree. Again, I don't want to make a big case about that. But I think that this book was a great description. And it really hits on this interesting topic where there's increasing amounts of anxiety, increasing amounts of depression. Uh, but the ability to study this and to revive an old thing that seemed to be working is just a great place to be right now. And at that point, I'll just take any questions. You look um, at local chat. Uh, Cut those yes. Off later. Yeah, Stephen, you know, um, I think it was in the same book you're talking about. I'm not sure. It may have been one of his other books. But Paulin does make an interesting argument that um, – you know, that certain plants, um, well, you know, as Tagline mentioned, you know, plants uh, develop alkaloids to taste bad as a defense mechanism. But the opposite can also be true, that plants can develop chemicals that are pleasurable to us uh, in order to, you know, attract us to them and make, you know, make themselves valuable to us. He, he sort of makes the argument that marijuana, for example, Sort of, I don't mean he's kind of anthropomorphizing here, but but essentially, um, marijuana wants to create a pleasant effect so that we'll cultivate it and protect it and domesticate it, um, and which is exactly what we've done by by creating a chemical that we like. Um, you know, uh, we protect it, and uh, so um, there are so plants can use a, a number of different strategies to survive and. One of which is to be appealing to humans. Yeah, no, that's a very good example. You know, one of the best examples of that is mistletoe, 
where it's a nice red berry, birds eat it. And in fact, for those seeds to germinate, they actually have to go through the acidity, sorry, the acidic environments of the bird's gut, but that helps it disperse wider. And that way the new mistletoe plants are not competing with their parent mistletoe plants. And I think that type of interaction is fascinating. It wasn't clear for me from pollen and doing some quick surveys if they've really discovered kind of like the real target in nature or what animal would help with the disbursement or what is the natural selection advantage for plants. It's not clear, but mushrooms are funny are fun stuff. Yeah, they do crazy stuff. Uh, okay, let's see if we have any other uh, questions here. Um, um, uh, earlier on, Shiloh had asked about addiction, and um, so I, um, you know, it's my understanding that psychedelics are are really not that addictive. I mean, I suppose their recreational effects uh, can sort of induce one to want to do them a lot, but I don't think that's the same thing as addiction. Um, I sort of have the impression that it's drugs that affect the dopamine system, reward center of the brain uh, that tend to be more addictive. Cocaine, for example, affects dopamine, um, but drugs that affect the serotonin system um, tend to be less addictive. Is that fair to say? No, that's actually very fair. A lot of people who were studying this in the 60, well, 50s, 60s, 70s, there were very clear animal models that you can give animals stuff that's addictive and they get addicted to it. They'll ignore their environments, they'll ignore each other. Yeah, rats, for example. Even. Yeah. Yeah, and there was no indication of that for LSD or, or psilocybin. Right, right. There's the famous rat study where they would just um, just constantly push the button to get more cocaine, you know, just obsessively. Uh, but you just don't see that behavior with psychedelics where people just will uh, just obsess over getting more, you know. So. Comment. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Uh, I agree that uh, with the dopaminergic um, circuits, you tend to get addictive behavior because you're getting reward. Um, the serotonin circuits, when they're stimulated just right, you get a warm, benevolent euphoria. And the people that tripped when they were not crazy to begin with, uh, or uh, they generally didn't want to leave it. They 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 enjoyed it so much. They felt wonderful. Uh, now there was a. I'm trying to remember the details. An experiment in which epinephrine, slow acting epinephrine, was given years ago, and people didn't know it. And they studied them, and they had somebody next to them who uh, complained, and then somebody that. Um, bragged and or spoke up about how great something was and whatever the tone of the thing was uh, the uh, response the individual on epinephrine tended to be amplified the epinephrine didn't make them crazy it made the it made it more intense and i think that because the in, in a sense i i had mentioned um, about um, the um, way the brain works and um, uh, this um, uh, self-organized uh, criticality, uh, it's, it's been likened to a resonant plate or a, a resonant instrument, and it breaks down barriers between parts of the brain uh, for focus, um, problem solving, and sense of self so that the possible resonance that can happen within the network is expanded. Yeah. And people the, can have new experience. And that's yeah, been. Yeah. Uh, that seems related to this, this notion of sort of ego dissolution, um, which can be highly beneficial for like anxiety disorders, which and tend PTSD. to be. Yeah, yeah. PTSD, which make you completely self centered and focused on yourself. Um, and if you can, and if you can escape the the trap of being completely absorbed uh, in yourself, uh, that it seems like that that would really be eye opening, you know, be a relief. Yeah, I, I had one other comment I wanted to make, and then I'll shut up if I may. Sure. Uh, the original legislature against 
uh, LSD and peyote and such was uh, thrown in with barbiturates and amphetamines. And if they found somebody that had done something that had some of that substance with them, they called up those circumstances. And even with the barbiturates and especially meth, they had very few, they had like 13 out of 125,000 potential cases that they called up as justification for all these laws. Um, not that meth particularly or amphetamines can't be harmful with chronic use, but I wanted to make a point. Uh, and they so they swept this up because the youth culture scared these old guys. And um, believe me, when, you know, I showed you a picture when I was in Oaxaca in, uh, I was uh, 16, a buddy of mine and I, he had a car. We went down there and went to all these ruins. Um, he ended up getting shot to death in a robbery in his truck uh, in uh, New Orleans. So he's, these are people that died as the song goes, but um, at any rate, how many people have died of marijuana overdose? How many people have died really of LSD overdose or peyote overdose? Um, the, yeah. Yeah, uh, I've looked up some figures just real quickly. In 2019, in the United States, 39,707 deaths from firearms occurred. 60% were suicides. In 2021, thus far, 17,749 uh, deaths from firearms have occurred. 7,915 were murders. 9,384 were suicides. 234 mass shootings in the United States so far this year. 15 mass murders. 124 children, 0 to 11 years old, killed. And in 2019, I have numbers that 85,688 people died liver deaths from alcohol. And aside from there is a certain number of people that die from liver from alcohol overdose. Uh, these are legal. They, I remember Chris Christopherson, the actor singer, said, uh, "Man, I didn't even know this uh, FTA, the Firearms uh, Tobacco and Alcohol Organization, existed." This was after they um, killed all those people in Waco, Texas. Huh. Yeah, he says, "Damn, those are some of my favorite things." <laughs> and uh, yuck, yuck, so yuck. these are the s things that uh, American society, anyway, I know this is an international group, but I'm speaking from this perspective, uh, uh, seem to think is fine to have legal. And uh, some states are encouraging it further, like Texas, which is uh, taking away any waiting periods or, or screening or anything for anyone who wants any any firearm. Constitutional yeah. carry, baby. That's what it's about here. So uh, let's continue so, this discussion uh, Wednesday at the Fireside Chat. Uh, I really want to draw this to a close now so we're not running too far over time. Um, yes. So, uh, you know, uh, thank you, Tagline, and thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate you stepping up uh, to be so well prepared at such short notice for this topic uh, uh, today. So really, really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, just as one Final closing thought, I would like to mention that Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is not about LSD. It's, um, it was inspired by a, a, paint, a drawing that Julian did when he was like seven years old. And the imagery in the song does not depict a acid trip. The imagery in the song is actually inspired by Alice in Wonderland, um, uh, which is a, a favorite book that... Uh, of John Lennon's from when he was a kid, um, and completely nothing to do with LSD. So, with, would with that, would you uh, <laughs> would you argue that John Lennon had never had LSD before he wrote uh, Lucy? Uh, pretty sure he had done a lot of LSD when he wrote Lucy. Yeah, I think so. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think there may have been influence. There may have been an influence. I'll I'll grant that. All right, you guys. Thanks so much, and thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, today. Really appreciate it, and I uh, hope you can uh, join us uh, Wednesday evening um, 
for the fireside chat. And with that, I'll gavel us to a close. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Bergon. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks from me as well. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you.